Welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of EOTT, Everything on the Table, with me, Jimmy James. And we are blessed today to have a beautiful lady from across the pond speaking with us, Dr. Jennifer Daniels. Uh, Dr. Daniels, how are you? Fine, thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you for taking the time to come and have a chat with us. Uh, some of you will obviously be already familiar with Dr. Daniels' work, and some of you won't. So, Dr. Daniels, I think I'll leave it to you, because it's quite a powerful story for you to, if you would be so kind, give us a... A bit of background of your kind of story on how you got to where you where you are now, if you would. Oh. <laughs> well, I'm 62 years old, so it's a pretty long journey. Ah, take your time, honestly. That's what we're about on EOTT. We take the time to get to the root of things. So yeah, honestly, it'd be lovely to hear the story and interject yeah. across along the way, of course. Yeah, a lot of people ask me like, like what what is my uh, motivation and how did things like really get started? And it really started uh, when I was uh, three years old. So when I was three. Uh, my parents were living in a neighborhood where we were, to put it mildly, unwelcome. And so the neighbors basically rioted in front of our house and threw stones and broke our windows and worked very hard to route us out and kill us. And for me, that was a really traumatic experience. I, I bet. Like, oh, my, parents, oh, so my parents decided to call the police. And so the police come. And the crowd tells the police, hey, we want them to get out, so I'm out of my neighborhood. Um, it was a racial thing, like uh, the neighborhood was a white neighborhood and we were a black family. But at three, I didn't get that nuance. And so um, the, the policeman, uh, you know, knocked on the door and appears like, oh, thank God you're here. And the policeman says, well, you know, you guys got, you got to get out of here. You, know, you, you can't leave. They said, oh, wait, we bought the house. He said, you bought the house. And they showed him the deed and everything. And he said, oh. So he turns to the crowd and says, I'm sorry, I can't help you. I can't, I can't kick him out. I wish I could help you, but you, know, you guys need to go home. So I was, at the age of three, totally unhappy with that response. He didn't tell right. the crowd they were wrong. He didn't um, express any sympathy towards nothing. And then, of course, he tells my parents, if I were you, I'd just move. So, uh, and the whole incident repeated itself again when I was um, four and a half-ish, five. Uh, and so finally my parents moved. So that's two, in my mind, two threats to my life. So then they moved to a mixed neighborhood. Um, Spanish speakers, American, whites, black, the mixed neighborhood. So they figured, okay, this is safe, not a problem. And so we lived there for about two months and then my parents left us, they had, they had five kids at the time, left us five children at home while they went to shop for furniture. And they came back to find the house had been burned down and all the kids were gone. And so what it actually oh, happened was the kid down the street got into an argument with the kid downstairs and the kid down the street burned the house down. And so me and my sisters were upstairs doing what, you know, uh, seven-year-olds do, right? We were playing with soap and makeup and stuff. And so uh, the house was burning down and whoever the authorities are, I said, okay, everyone get away. No one can go back in the house. Get out, get out. And my brother slipped through the barricade and ran upstairs to tell us to get out the house that was burning. And so he saved our lives. And we, uh, me and my two sisters ran down the stairs, you know, we had no shoes, nothing. It was, it was freezing cold in winter in, um, in upstate New York. And so that was the third attempt on my life. And not to go into all the attempts, but there were a few more. So <clears throat> I made up my mind that this is like really a bad feeling. Thing, and I would never do such a thing. So I made myself a promise that I would never, ever kill another person. I, I just was not going to kill people, and I wasn't going to harm people. In fact, I'm going to be a doctor and help people. And then also I decided that people were killing me, not, nothing personal. I mean, no one even knew my name. I just happened to be there. I said, oh, I need to get famous and famous for helping people, and then no one will want to harm me. This was my three to seven to 10 to 18 year old mind. And so when I was 18, I escaped a lynching. And that was even after the civil rights movement. And so oh. I thought, life is pretty, you know, it's dangerous out here. So the important thing to understand is I made a promise to myself that I was not going to kill people, that I just was not signing up for that. And then um, I did really well in school. I was accepted to Harvard. I was pre-med, did very well with that. And when it became obvious to me that I was going to get into medical school, it was like a shoe-in because my grades were so good and everything. Um, 
I went to the, the famous library at Harvard, Widener Library, to research how doctors help people, how they help people get better, how they help people live longer, because I wanted to be an outstanding doctor. And this is not just any library. This is the library in America, uh, next to the Library of Congress. So in order to get into this library, you have to be a Harvard student, pay lots of money, have special permissions. Those are the sacred documents kept there, and still is to this day. So I researched this topic only to find that doctors do not in any way extend life. Medical care does not extend life. It doesn't even make people healthy. So, oh my God, <laughs> I was pretty deep in, I was very heavily invested. And I said, it's so of course, curious, well, what does? And the books were very clear. And so what makes people live longer is um, quality, clean food, clean water, uh, clean air and sanitation. Oh, and shelter. So you need to be sheltered from the elements. You're not gonna live long in, in the snow. Yeah. I said, uh huh, okay. Well, I'm gonna go on to medical school and I'm sure they're gonna mention those things. <laughs> so I go to medical school and they don't mention any of those things. Months of work, nothing. Then um, in medical school, I noticed nobody's getting better. The more we treat people, the sicker they get, the worse they get. And I noticed that um, my professors were just elated. The sicker people got, the sicker they were when they came, people were absolutely elated. Because that meant you could do more, you could charge more. And I'm like, whoa, this is not, this, this is not the, uh, not what I, what I was interested in. I'm, I'm trying to help folks get better. Yeah. My big goal is to go back to the neighborhood I grew up in, which is, so my parents decided it was safer to live in the inner city ghetto with drugs, prostitution, and crime than to live in the middle class white suburb. So that's what happened. So I grew up uh, most of my childhood in the ghetto. And actually it's pretty safe. Not a problem. No attempts on my life in the ghetto. It was, it was just fine. Uh, so I decided I would return to the ghetto, get everybody healthy so they could work harder and have a better quality of life. That was, again, my naive child vision. And so I'm going to medical school, and at the end of each semester, it's looking pretty dismal. And so I go to the dean, dean of students, and I say, hey, dean, I'm going back to the inner city ghetto to help people get better. And if I bring them this kind of stuff that's making them sicker, they're going to they're gonna kill me. You know, I'll be in danger. They don't believe in malpractice. It ain't illegal stuff over there. They, they handle stuff on the spot. I said, oh, well, next semester, next semester, they're going to teach you all the cures. I said, okay, okay, okay. At the end of the next semester, no cures. Go back to the dean. We have the same conversation. So every semester we have this conversation. Finally, <coughs> in my fourth year, we have this conversation. He says, you know, I think maybe you should, maybe, maybe don't go back to the ghetto. Maybe practice someplace else. Like, what are you saying? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. She's, not, she's not ready to hear this. They're going to teach you the real <clears throat> That's why we have a residency program. That's why it's required to do a year of training after medical school, because that is where you learn the short. I, okay, okay, good, good, good. So, but meanwhile, in the back of my mind, I... I was getting a little uh, antsy. I said, well, this education is not worth borrowing any money for. So if it's not really going to help anyone live longer, I certainly don't want to borrow money to learn. But what I'll do is learn my kind of medical school and build on that when I graduate. <coughs> and since I went to an Ivy League medical school, they were programming us to be leaders. And so they were saying, okay, you guys are going to be standard bearers. You're going to continue learning after medical school. Or you're going to develop new and greater, better things. And then I go to residency, and I train at a hospital for the rich and not so famous. So our clientele at this hospital were politicians, uh, wealthy businessmen, um, you know, the, the Eisenhowers and Nixons went there, the, that kind of hospital, where our patients were far more affluent than the doctors. So like, okay, great, here I am. And it was terrible. It was just carnage. It was just People being killed and mutilated and tortured. I was like, oh my God, this is terrible. So uh, <clears throat> everything I saw that went wrong, I made up my mind that, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. And there came to be a critical point where a uh, doctor gave me a direct order to do something that I knew would kill the patient. And I said, well, 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 well. 
I said to myself, here it is. Draw the line here. We don't mm -hmm. kill people. And yeah. so I wrote up all the orders, everything he wanted. And I said, who? I, I do an X in the line. I said, yeah, sign right here. He actually signed the orders. And the patient received the deadly therapy. And um, the patient unluckily did not die. He lost his eyesight. He bled, needed 26 minutes of blood transfuse. And it was, yeah, it was very bad. Totally ruined his life. He's a dentist. So you can imagine being a blind dentist. He was. Yeah. So um, I did not realize that medicine was designed to kill, designed to harm. And that me having that, that rule where I wasn't killing anybody would ultimately lead to me being evicted from the profession. And so <clears throat> what happened then was I continued, I did the residency, finished it. I then became the medical director and only physician at a remote Indian reservation. I said, okay, now I'm gonna find stuff out because I had the authority to organize the care to make sure, make sure that there was no slip ups. And so we were told in medical school that the therapy was not working because people were stupid, they couldn't read, they didn't follow instructions, and they were poor and couldn't get the proper medicines and things we recommended. I said, okay, no problem. So I had, we had a pharmacy right there, 10 feet from the doctor's office. Literally, I wrote the prescriptions, the pharmacy filled it, and they got the medicine on the spot. So that slip up, not there. Their family was notified of the proper instructions. We had a visiting nurse that visited the home, but there was no appreciable non-compliance. Yet nobody got better. So then I said, okay, this is, this, we, we gotta, I gotta fix this. And that's when I first started recommending um, people change their diet, that they do things like take a walk around the block. And um, we had a diabetes clinic. clinic. And so when I changed people's diet and just had them walk around the block, the diabetes went away, usually in a matter of like two weeks. And to me, this was like, well, wait a minute, I'm no genius. How come they didn't teach us in medical school? Well, obviously, they must not be interested in it. But even worse, uh, the administrator of the clinic came and talked to me and said, you are not to give any dietary advice to these diabetics. The nutritionist does that. So she was recommending white bread, margarine, you know, no one was going to get rid of their diabetes with her instructions. And so I realized then that I needed to practice in a solo practice setting where I was in charge and where I could have the freedom to do helpful things and not do harmful things. And so I returned to Syracuse, New York, purchased a city block in the ghetto. Land was very affordable. The whole block was only $25,000. And I built a medical office building on that spot. And um, started practicing medicine. And the first year, I think two or three people died, which is not much death for a doctor's office. The second year, the same. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me examine these charts and see if there's something I can do better to prevent deaths. And I was shocked and horrified to find every single person who died was thoroughly diagnosed, was on the proper medication and the proper doses, kept all their appointments, took their medication, and I'd even had them see a specialist to make sure they were on the optimal therapy regimen. All those patients who skipped appointments, didn't follow instructions, non-compliant, they lived. I said, ooh, this is really, really bad. So then I um, gave people instructions, but here's the deal. This is the standard of care. According to what I've learned in medical school, you should take this drug, blah, 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 blah. However, this drug does have side effects. Here they are. If you get any side effects, stop the drug and let me know. And then I said, now, you don't even have to take the drug. You can do this lifestyle change. You can take this supplement. You can, or you can even do nothing. So when I gave people that little lecture, the death rate went to zero. Zero. 
And I said, oh my God. You mean, I'm a train killer? Really? Oh my God. Hard to get to grips with, right? Huh? Well, it's kind of hard to get to grips with. You kind of, you know, as I say, you get kind of the cognitive dissonance where people are trained into it and then starting to see these signs. And for all the people in the same position as yourself, they're obviously going to see these things. Yeah. And hang on a minute. But if you get to a certain level and the others obviously the level of, you know, they're asking him to literally kill, you know, something that you knew was going to kill that gentleman or whoever it was, the lady. And then you think, nah, that's it. And then, you know, it all kind of shows itself for what it is. Themselves. They have to go into a state of denial or they go into rationalization. Well, the government says it's okay. Um, it's not against the law. The patient's cooperating. The patient wants this. There's all kinds of rationalizations you can make. But since I had made myself this promise that I was not killing anybody, all the rationalization just wasn't, it, 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 no, it's not. Mm -hmm. So I was, was uh, just working on getting people better. And all, a lot of diseases, like diabetes, arthritis, lupus, hypertension, that we were taught in medical school were incurable, people were actually getting cured. <clears throat> and I said, oh my God. Hmm. And then um, at that point, I noticed that people were getting cured, but if they went off their diet or were in any way non-compliant, they would relapse. I said, that's not right. There should be some way to return them to their pre-disease state. So that if they eat a piece of bread or have a soda pop, they don't fall apart. And so I said, well, there must be some way to do that. There's got to be. And so what I did was I started buying all kinds of alternative healing books and reading them. And there was nothing. Uh, yes. Sorry to interrupt you, lovely. Yeah, can you just move it a little bit closer, please, lovely? Because um, the conversation is yeah. great, but it's just all right. So I'll yeah, just it's quite right here. That's How's fine. That? Yeah, yeah. You're a little bit. Um, I know you can't see me, but I know it's kind of one of those situations. But yeah, if you right, so we're gonna do the best we can. We're having a. Uh, I live in a tropical rainforest, and so we're having a heavy rainfall. Oh, beautiful! It'll eventually clear up, uh, probably before our, our talk. Awesome. So I started looking for this thing, whatever it is that would restore people to their pre-sickness health. Meanwhile, I was homeschooling my kids. And I homeschooled my kids because my schedule as a doctor did not allow me to cooperate with what the school would want me to do. I couldn't play chauffeur for the kids. I couldn't do this extracurricular thing. I couldn't be bothered with them bringing notes from home telling me to go shopping. So I was homeschooling. So I was doing a fair amount of reading on my own. And I came across this passage that said that slaves in colonial America um, had amazing cures for stuff. And that whenever the slave master became ill, like deadly ill, he would go to the slave quarters and ask the slaves to please heal him. And um, of course his doctor had told him, sell everything, the end is near. And so he'd go to the slaves and say, hey, please cure me, I'll give you whatever you want, I, but you gotta help me. And without fail, they would heal the slave master. It would get better. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. That sounds like what I'm looking for, whatever that thing is. And I said, wait a minute. If slaves had it, it had to be cheap. It sure couldn't need refrigeration because they didn't have access to that. And it had to be easily stored and all around us, all around us. In fact, probably it's somewhere today where I could get at it easily. I said, well, I don't know what that is. <laughs> So I continued to read and research and I didn't find anything that fit that bill. And then I said, wait, I have a medical practice full of people descended from slaves. And so at the end of every visit, I would ask my patients if there was something that their parents or grandparents used that was cheap and cured everything. And the first several people said, oh, geez, sorry, doc. I don't know. Can't help you. And then one guy just fell out laughing. He said, oh, my God. Oh, my God. It's that turpentine and sugar. Oh, no. I thought I'd left that behind. <laughs> and so I said, well, what about turpentine and sugar? He said, well, whenever anybody was sick, grandma came running. She came running with that bottle. She had turpentine and sugar. Nobody ever wanted to be sick. So they had no malingering problem. <laughs> 
people did it work? He said, yeah, yeah, it worked. But you, no one wanted peptide sugar. I said, okay. I said, well, your grandmother, oh, God, she must be dead now. She was 45 years old. He said, no, she's alive. Really? Kicking she on must strong. Be, she must be in a nursing home. He said, no, she lives in her own house. I said, really? Assisted living? No. She cleans her own house and cooks her own food. I said, well, how old is she? He said, she's 92. Nice. Oh, my God. <laughs> 92 years old, uses turpentine and sugar, and is cleaning her own house and cooking her own food. I said, well, I'm going to try it. I said, well, how much turpentine? He said, I don't know. How much sugar? He said, I don't know. How often? He said, well, I only took it when I had to, and they made me. And now I'm grown, and I got health insurance. That's why I come see you, so I don't take <laughs> I said, oh. <laughs> but I... Uh, Went to the hardware store and got some turpentine. And I went to the grocery store and got some sugar cubes and started experimenting. And then <clears throat> the rest of the story is in the document. But um, once I took it, and I felt perfectly fine, and I got to feeling even better. I said, whoa, this is amazing. And then I had my mother try it, who had had chronic pain for uh, 20 years, and her pain went away. Then I had my sister-in-law try it, and just everyone had miraculous uh, effects from it. And I said, wow, well, I'm going to start offering it to the patients who have serious incurable diseases. It worked for them, and then I started using it for less and less serious things. And um, the last straw was uh, when a patient came to me, he, he was tired, he was drinking a lot, he was pissing a lot. And his, I checked his blood sugar in the office. It was like 476. And I said, hey, look, here's what you do. And I didn't recommend turpentine, but I'll just change his diet. And in one week, his blood sugar is down to 136. So, you know, no hospitalization, no drugs, nothing. And uh, he says, well, I'm going on a trip to uh, the Bahamas. Uh, you think that'd be okay? I said, well, yeah. You know, if you can just, uh, you know, no alcohol. And... Um, you know, stick to your diet, should go, should be fine. And so he comes back from his trip to the Bahamas and goes out to dinner on a Friday night. And from dinner, dinner, Friday night, goes straight to the emergency room where his blood sugar is 400 or 500 or something. And so it turns out over time, someone else who went to the Bahamas with him submitted photographs showing that he had over 60 alcoholic drinks in the one week. So, of course, you know, what do you think? And I didn't recommend yeah. it. But the state used that as an entree to taking my license away. But a side note, if I had given him the standard of care, which would have been insulin, he would have died in the Bahamas because that amount of alcohol plus insulin would, is deadly. Mm. So, oh, yeah. uh, because I drew the line at killing, my license was taken away. That would be the bad news. The good news is <laughs> I um, ultimately left the United States. Um, I was financially wiped out, depleted, which was legal fees and having to support myself and the children for those years as well. And so I came to Panama, started over. I had already taped a CD about turpentine and was trying to sell it with like no, no luck at all. And I met this online marketer, and he's like, wow, this is amazing. And so um, he did a marketing campaign for it, and it, just a PDF, nothing else, PDF, sold $35,000 in one week. And I said, wow, people are interested. And even more so, people started using it and getting effects and benefits. It is the internet, so the document was stolen and plastered all over the internet everywhere. And so that was the whole beginning of a, that was a whole nother beginning. Meanwhile, while I was practicing medicine, I developed vitality capsules, which helped people poop. So I had noticed that I could put a person on the best diet, have them do everything right. And if they were not pooping, they would not get better. And so people told me, Dr. Nails, you come up with a pill, I can take the poop, I will take it. And I said, okay. So I got to work on that, developed vitality capital. People took it. They pooped. They were happy. 
I was uh, grinding and mixing the herbs in my kitchen and my son was packing the capsules in the dining room. And now we have a company that does all of that. So once the Candy the Cleaner, which is the name of the document talking about turpentine was released, um, people became more aware of vitality capsules and they started using it. And now, you know, things are fine. I managed to dig out of my um, debt rut of basically $260,000 that dug out of that, paid off all my debts. And, you know, now I'm living happily uh, in the rainforest, in the jungle. Nice. Beautiful. What is in the, uh, whilst it's on my mind and I don't forget, what is the um, ingredients, if you're allowed to share them, unless it's one of those secret recipes, but I imagine you'll no, no, be able to no. tell me what kind of herbs and whatever you use in there. I'm sure it's not a secret. Yeah. So the uh, big deal with the Vitality Capsule is that they work by improving circulation. So toxins that never even got to the liver are now brought to the liver. And then they work by cleaning out the bile ducts. And in many people, the bile ducts stay clogged. So even though they poop, the bile ducts are clogged, so the toxins are never released. And then the third thing it does, it clears out the small intestine as well as the large intestine. And so the uh, ingredients in the extra strength, which is the version that I originally released, is garlic. <clears throat> so garlic, uh, enhances the circulation and brings the toxins to the liver. Garlic also repels parasites. They don't, they don't want to stay around. And then there's ginger. Ginger reduces inflammation by increasing circulation, again, bringing toxins to the um, liver. And it also um, helps with the intestines to receive the bile better. And then there's aloe. It, uh, I use a special aloe, Cape aloe, which only grows in South Africa, one place in the world. And it helps with uh, having, creating bowel movements, but also strengthening the intestines. It improves gastritis, ulcers, and it really helps greatly with healing. And then there's senna in there, which also is a laxative. However, it aids in emptying the small intestine as well as the large intestine. And its effects though are balanced by ginger, and so it has a limited concentration, so it's effective, but it's gentle. Then there's Cascara Sagrada, which does the heavy lifting, as well as Barberry. Both of these move the bile through the bile ducts. And many people don't realize that bile, as well as being the poisons and toxins removed from the blood, also is an emulsifier and helps digestion when it gets to the intestines. And so it removes the congestion in the bile ducts prevents gallstones, prevents uh, liver stones and indigestion, and uh, also helps with the colon, and as does the barberry. And then there's cayenne pepper, it's a strong stimulant, and amplifies all the other ingredients. Sounds pretty good. And how long have you been, how long have you been making this one for? Since 1995. 95, that's quite a way, and what, if I may ask, if, uh, how much of a loyal kind of customer base have you built up to show the you know the efficacy of the the capsules? Thousands of people. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Oh, well, that's fantastic. Yeah, you've had quite uh, quite a story there, Doctor Daniels. Is uh, you know there's so many different perspectives that we need to kind of get to, and uh, yours I was you know come across your work quite a few years back and. Um, yeah, at the time, I, I was part of a few different groups uh, on Facebook, and people were doing the turpentine kind of treatment and showing, you know, you know, evacuating kind of worms and all sorts. It was quite, uh, yeah, it was quite shocking. But yeah, yeah, yeah it did seem that um, it was quite. The general consensus was that most people were getting, uh, you know, positive benefits from it and doing their thing. But I think. It's important to stress if anyone's listening, there are different types of turpentine gums. So when people think of turpentine, I think they think of white spirits, which is usually clean paintbrushes right. and stuff. You're, the one you're talking about is a different type, isn't it? Right. So there's, when you say turpentine, it can be any of 20 different things. Okay. So when you say gum, 
that means it's from the sap of the pine tree. When you say spirits, that means that sap was distilled. So it, all three words, turpentine, gum, spirits are essential to getting the right thing. Yeah, it's very important because uh, you will know all about it if you do the wrong one. <laughs> yeah, the wrong one won't work. No, Some not at all. Get, uh, gum. And when they get the gum, they have the sap that's not distilled. And so it has the water fraction in it as well as the oil fraction. And that's right. kind of powerful. And some people will want to use the actual gum, the resin or the pitch. That is very, very harsh. So the distilled uh, sap or the spirit is gentle but effective. Right. Right, and I know all the information is on your website, and I will put the links in the uh, in the description box. I wanted to address something, Dr. Daniels, because as I said, I followed your work, and it kind of made sense to me, and your story makes sense, and um, the anecdotal kind of story from the people in the Facebook groups. But then, you know, kind of for more, for a lot of us who know how the system structured, it's unfortunate that kind of high up on Google, one of the first things you find when you type in Dr. Jennifer Daniels is a report on is a science-based medicine from the um and it's kind of it's a bit of a hatchet job to be fair what do you find that's, that's my opinion i think it's a real hatchet job what do you find if i can ask have been the the major what's the what's what's the main thing that people always say as the opposing arguments to this kind of um uh, it says different time <laughs> oh science-based medicine.org Oh. It's one of them, yeah. It was quite high up, and uh, yeah, it was. Um, I think she's. Oh, there we go. The yeah, uh, there we go. That's what I said. And obviously, I'm already familiar with yourself, but I do know that listeners might come, see your name, have a little look, and if they come across that quite early on, you know, some people are swayed without really doing any proper, you know, discernment and research, and it's unfortunate that's quite high up there on the STO. But you know. People need to take the time to, you know, take in both sides and make your own minds up. And as I said, I kind of can resonate with it because of the amount of reading and, you know, other people's experiences. But, um, yeah, what do you find that generally, you know, when people come, come up oh, against it, what is the kind of disinformation, if you like? Yeah, I've got no, I've got no uh, dog in that fight. I think it's an individual personal decision. If someone mm. needs to or not, it does not interest me. That is yeah. their personal decision. Yeah. I, I have no interest, whatever. So this is so, the difference. In medical practice, I was under investigation. It was clear I was going to lose my license. And so there's big rush among people who are into alternative therapy <coughs> to come see me. This one lady, she was sick. Things were going terribly. Uh, her life was falling apart. She couldn't even function as a, 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 as a housewife. She couldn't be helpful to her kid. Everything was just bad. She couldn't even carry the laundry up the steps. Nothing. She was totally helpless, useless, and worthless. Okay, got that. So her husband brings her to me, and I tell him about turpentine. And she says, oh, you're going to have to convince me. I said, oh, no, no, that's your job. Uh, my job is to tell you the truth as far as I know it. If you need convincing, good luck. That's your job. And so it took her a month to finally try the turpentine. She tried it. She followed the instructions. Boom, everything cleared up. So it's not my job to convince anybody of anything. I only, I'm not even interested. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is the difference. Yes, thank you, Dr. Daniel. This is the difference between, as you say, giving somebody, it's basically informed consent, showing them the information, whereas it, within the pharmaceutical and the medical industry, a lot of the time there is no co informed consent. Or so, for example, you'll go and get some antidepressants no, no, and be told. I don't sell turpentine. I no, no, I'm aware of that. Yeah. yeah no, no, I'm aware that. of that. <laughs> this is just yeah. a humanitarian, um, you know, I discovered this thing. It's, it's, it's worked miracles for many of my patients. Uh, it is amazing. And so I felt that the biggest contribution I can make to humanity was to share this. And to share some of the experience I observed in my medical practice with this. This is like a holy cow. I mean, a can of turpentine. Uh, the can they show on the whatever on this uh, piece PDF would last you that's a year's worth of health care for most people that would save them easily twenty thousand dollars in, in insurance co-pays blah 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 as well as save their life the health 
industry in the United States freely admits they are the third leading cause of death. They kill more people than AIDS. They kill more people than diabetes. They freely admit this. Yeah. And something that kills that <clears throat> many people, they admit to 300,000. My count is 880,000. Whatever. It's still a big number. Um, yeah. And it's something some people might want to avoid. I mean, if you're willing to use a condom to avoid AIDS, you should be willing to try turpentine to avoid the healthcare system. <laughs> I, I mean, that's a rational human being thinking. I like that one. If you're not willing, you know, just ask yourself, how far are you willing to go to avoid AIDS? Would you make a monthly payment every month of $500 to $5,000 to get AIDS to make sure you have access to it? Oh, you wouldn't? You wouldn't? It only kills 14,000 Americans a year, and that's an overestimate. But you're paying to have access to something that kills, by their own admission, more than 300,000 Americans? I think people need to make their own decision. If that's the kind of logic you're using, hey, live by it. Go for it. You're an, people are adults. If they're entitled to make those decisions, and I respect that. Yeah, now this is what we're about, just EOTT, everything on the table, we get the information out there and people could get the perspectives and make their own decision, you know, and that's how it just needs to be, that's how it needs to work. So I see you told us you're down in Panama, am I right in saying that um, there's a lot of work going on in Panama with kind of stem cell research and stuff? Uh I think it's, it's accurate to say there's a lot going on in Panama with stem cell implementation. And I'm right. Sure they're administering stem cells. Yeah. What is what what what's your take on kind of stem cell research? Is that something you? What do you make of it? Because it's my understanding about I've, I found something the other day and it was to do with um, the fact that the medical industry will cut the cord early and things like this for the uh, the amniotic sac and all the rest of it, when in reality it should be birthed and the blood should be allowed to go up into the baby, all this kind of stuff. Because am I right in saying that's what they used for stem cells for the, from the uh, umbilical cord and that kind of stuff for the stem cell research? Is that what they do? Or is that not really your kind of field of interest? More nefarious than that. There is a test in the United States called amniocentesis. All right, you know what that is? Lady's pregnant, she's got amniotic fluid. Make. In there. Yeah. And you yeah. Stop if you do that, then you're going to kill one half of 1% of all babies who are submitted to that procedure. Okay, so that's a kill rate of 10 per thousand. Um, I'm sorry, uh, 50, see, 1% is one. And that'll be 10 per thousand. So five per thousand. Five per thousand are killed just by getting amniocentesis. That liquid is where the stem cells come from. Now, infant mortality in the United States is only six per thousand. So just this procedure doubles infant mortality. And these babies are literally being killed. These are babies that would have lived um, had their mother not had amniocentesis. But, so basically, it's a form of cannibalism, just to be blunt about it. Yeah, no, be as blunt as you like. That's what we're about. We need to get this information out. And inserting them into other living people. So you might as well just cook those kids up and serve them for dinner. They're dead, and their tissues are being put into other people. All right, so stem, cell, stem cells are a form of cannibalism. If they use your stem cells, it's auto-cannibalism. That would be like you cutting off your finger, cooking it up, and eating it. All right. Mm -hmm. So whether you're in favor of cannibalism or not, it's, it's up to you. I, no judgment. Uh, I even looked up to see if cannibalism was illegal in the United States. It is not. Just saying. Okay. Right. So we're dealing with basically cannibalism here. The next question is, is this cannibalism beneficial to the recipient? Obviously, it's not beneficial to donor, right? <laughs> Solve that one. Uh, so there's been a lot of stem cell research done in the United States. And if you look at the stem cell research, none of it proves that some of it says stem cells are effective for different things. Let's put that aside. The vast body of the research shows stem cell therapy is totally ineffective. All right. 
let's look at, this, at the study showing it is effective. Those studies have been recalled due to fraud. And I found that out indirectly when I was investigating research fraud. So I looked at research fraud, and there's a lot of it, you know, it's ongoing, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I said, well, what was the research that they falsified? What were they doing research on? Stem cell, stem cell, stem cell, stem cell, stem cell. Well, was anyone locked up? No, nope, no one arrested. Was anyone fined? No, nope, no one penalized. So, in a nutshell, there's absolutely no research supporting stem cell therapy that has survived the inspection for fraud. Okay. So we're a method that has absolutely no scientific support. This has not escaped the notice of the FDA and the medical industrial complex. <clears throat> so what happens though, the problem is this. The medical industrial pro uh, complex oversold stem cells. So when I was in medical school, we were taught about what a stem cell was. It's this one cell that could become anything you want. I'm talking about magic, right? And it could, it could grow an eyeball, grow this, grow that, and stay tuned, more research coming. Okay, got that. And back then, the only stem cells that were believed to be effective were the ones from um, the amniotic fluid or the amniotic uh, material. Now they said, oh, wait, oh, wait, oh, oh, wait. There are stem cells in the muscles. There are stem cells in the joints. There are stem cells everywhere. So you got to ask the question. If the stem cells are already there, why hasn't the person's body healed itself? Right? Mm -hmm. Does that yeah. sound reasonable? The stem cells are laying around. Why aren't they getting to work? And so it turns out that the stem cells are not functioning, not because the individual is old, but because the individual is malnourished. The stem cells are literally like a bunch of workmen on the work site. Yes, boss. Yes, boss. We'll build what you want, boss. Yes, yes, yes. And they got no board feet, no conduit pipe, no cement blocks. Nothing to work with. And they're sitting there saying, hey, Bob, you give us something to work with, we'll build you what you want. That's the situation. If you take that situation and bring in more workers, it's not going to get anything built. And that's where we are. So I had a friend here, and I don't have a car, and I don't drive, by the way. So she drove me <coughs> to the next town an hour away to pick up stuff that I've been needing. I, I keep a list at the end of the month or two months or whenever I can catch a ride, I go to town. So I was really grateful for her giving me the ride to town. So on the ride to town, she says, you know, I'm going to get stem cells. I'm going to get stem cells with my back pain. It's killing me. My back is killing me. It's been hurting me for I don't know how many years, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to get stem cells. What do you think about stem cells? I said, well, I try not to. She says, well, what do you mean? She has to just what I said. I don't think about it. She says, well, what, what should I do with my back? I said, I tell you what. I'm going to tell you to eat something. And if you eat something and your back pain goes away, then stem cells are both bullshit. What do you think? That's all fair enough to me. So yeah, it'll save you $5,000, $10,000, $20,000. Right? Sound good? I told her what to eat. She ate it. Back pain gone. I said, okay, stem cell bullshit. She said, okay. There you go. That's my position. That's what I said. There we go. I appreciate that. Thank you, Dr. Daniels. Yeah. And, um, yeah, because I said I don't really know much about it that I was looking. I've been um, recently introduced to a lovely fella. The stuff written about it is so friggin' vague. That's why you don't know much about it. Yeah. It's not that you're stupid. It's not that you haven't looked. Because this is it. For a while, I would just say, okay, let me check into stem cells. Let me just check into stem cells. I'm like, I'm reading this stuff, and it's like you can't get your hand on it, you know? And finally, I said, stop the presses, hold everything. Put all of the matters aside, I am going to investigate. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to read at least 100 articles on stem cells. And I only want the good stuff. I don't want to hear no bad news. And there, was no, no, there are no studies showing it works. Wow, this is very telling, isn't it? Mm, yes, indeed. Um, would you be kind enough to talk to me a little bit about your understanding of uh, immunotherapy, like GC math? Ditto, 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 ditto. <laughs> ditto. Oh, did it not come? Ditto. Okay. Yeah, ditto. I'll just, ditto. So, so it's all. Here's the problem. 
you've got a kid, we're talking autism, right? Kid's autistic. He's got a brain. The brain's not working. Let's be really blunt about this. Brain's not working. If you have a toaster that's not working, what do you do? What would you do? Your toaster's not working. Buy a new one. You Change the fuse usually. Or buy a new one, yeah. Buy a new one. That sounds reasonable. What else might you do? I'm not sure. You might fix it. Oh, right, of course. Go and you get some spare parts and fix it, right? <laughs> of course. <laughs> All right. So people are overthinking this autism thing. Okay. The kid's friggin' brain has been damaged. Let's just use mental retardation, can we please, instead of autism? Yeah, I know. A lot of hate mail. That's okay. We delete those. Not a problem. But the kid's mentally retarded. His brain is damaged. You got to fix it. The same way you fix your friggin' toaster. You need some spare parts. Or replace it. It's like you replace your toaster. It's just that complicated. And GCMAF doesn't do any of those. That's, again, straightforward, plain talk. And I've had a lot of GCMAF failures contact me because they got GCMAF for this or for that. Uh, so what's the answer? What's the answer? How do you fix or repair a damaged brain? Right? Another unpopular answer, but that's okay. Not a popularity contest. You eat pig brain or cow brain. And guess what? Boom, IQ sword. Um, so I'm using it now to reverse Alzheimer's, forgetfulness. Uh, people are literally the sharpest tack. And their kids, are, their, their kids, we're taking care of the old folks with Alzheimer's, are noticing that the old person's recovering functionality literally by the day. From eating pig's brains and cow brains. And what is it? Um, is it actually the same material that's kind of, do you know they say like for, um, your kind of protein uh, markers, you won't obviously, when people try to bodybuild there, for example, and I know it's um, kind of, you don't need meat to grow protein. Obviously you can pro grow protein from plant materials, but they say about- Not true, not true, not true. Go on, go on then. There's no plant source of collagen, none, zero, zippo, nada. There's no plant source of cholesterol, none, zippo, nada. And so every single cell in your body is covered with cholesterol cell receptors for communication. So if you're on a diet with no animal products, no cholesterol, cell to cell communication will suffer. Right. This is why babies suck milk from their mothers, all right? They don't eat crushed up plants because they need that animal product stuff. Your body has an absolute, absolute need for cholesterol. Why? It only makes 70% of what it needs. The other 25%, it can't make. And this is why cholesterol-lowering drugs cause pain all over the body, because it destroys the cell receptors, not enough cholesterol. That's why taking cholesterol medicine accelerates and creates Alzheimer's. It's not enough cholesterol for the brain. If your body now is rationing, the cholesterol, okay, not, not a little less for you, a little, little less for you. All right, well, what's the minimum we got to do here to keep things going? So if you've got somebody who's stupid, Alzheimer's, autism, mental retardation, a vegan, vegetarian, whole food, plant-based diet, will help clear out the dead, damaged, unneeded, crappy brain tissue. But then you need to come back in with the pig or cow brain to rebuild it. So you, you want to maybe go vegan for a week, cow brain. Vegan for a week, cow brain. Vegan for a week, cow brain. And you're going to build a new brain. People are going to be horrified by this, Dr. Daniels, the thought of eating cow and pig brain. But Everything on the table. Everything on the table. Yeah, right? of course. Yeah, but no. If, yeah, yeah, I was about to fall. Table, guess what? No, 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 no. Let me let me follow up. I was just about to say you. This is your experience. You're seeing it on the ground. You know what I mean? I'm I'm open to everything personally. You know, and I've always said like, you know, I, I was vegan for like four years, and then when I was sectioned in 2017 or last year, I've had cheese, I've had a bit of dairy, and all the rest of it. And then um, I've more is now coming back around so it was this big push this big you know veganism agenda this pushing 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 and as a result then we've seen massive massive increases in commercialized basically crap from the supermarkets and all the shops processed stuff and all the rest of it and what i'm coming to now is this starting to come up that you, you just need that balance and 
you know, I've seen Avatar, I think. Yeah, I've seen Avatar. You know, factory farming is disgraceful. I've seen all the documentaries and they're just heartbreaking. But like, exactly. there is... The meat does not need to come from a factory farm. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So can I ask what kind of, what, what is your kind of diet, Dr. Daniels? You don't have to, you know, go into much detail, but what do you kind of tend to avoid? I was vegan for 26 years. And, well, doctor, why would you stop being vegan? I stopped being vegan because I couldn't friggin' remember my own name. In other words, my brain was actually dissolving. Actually, that did not get me to stop being vegan. What really got me to stop being vegan was I became bedridden. Could not get out of bed. Literally. The decision to get up and go to the bathroom was a monumental um, decision. Oh, I think I can hold it a little longer. <laughs> well, I don't really need to go now. Well, couldn't I put something by the bedside? And so when I found myself unable to get out of bed and debating uh, what assistive aids I might want to use, I said, oh, there's a problem here. I said, well, if diet can heal, I must be on the wrong diet. And I was strict vegan, no dairy, no animal products. Um, everything was organic. And I cooked at home. So that was it. And I was bedridden. I said, well, it must be something missing from my diet. And I said, I wonder what could be missing from my vegan diet. So I said, well, when I became vegan, I was eating flesh meats. And that made me sick, which is why I became vegetarian. And I have a dairy sensitivity, which is why I became vegan. So I needed to add something back to my diet that was not dairy and was not flesh meat. What would that be? So I started with eggs. And I got some energy when I ate eight eggs a day. That's a lot of eggs. I said, must be something else missing. I said, okay. As a kid, I was extremely healthy, lots of energy, no problem. What did I eat as a kid that was not flesh meat? Answer, liver. I ate one piece of liver. Boom, up out of the bed, full energy. And so it was just an eye-opener for me. And I started exploring from then <coughs> what animal meats or organs could cure what affliction. So it turns out that steak stopped urinary incontinence. Turns out that... Um, Animal brain cures, emotional problems, mental problems, <coughs> IQ problems, and you know, animal feet cure joint problems. What do you suppose it is that's within the feet that's actually doing that? Is it certain kind of um, concentrations of, for example, uh, you know? Um, Ligaments and tendons, that kind of cellular material is breaking down and restructuring in the human body, do you think? Is that what's kind of happening? Exactly. For your body, if you have a joint problem, you have a joint problem because your body lacks the spare parts to maintain your joint. And so when you eat a joint-rich material, like the foot of an animal, you get the spare parts you need. Hmm. I've read about this and it, you know, it makes sense. And obviously you're telling me you've got anecdotal evidence off the ground, uh, from on the ground. So, you know, people can only learn and experience through their own doing and their own experience, as you say. So this is it. And it's weird. Where are you at in your life? Are you at a point where, you know, as you said, when you're in bed and you can't do anything, you will literally try anything. But some people will just fight on and fight on and push through and push through. And then eventually get to the doctor and the doctor says, yeah, you've got like days to live. When you're bedridden, there's no... There's no yeah. There's no mm. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so, can I ask them what do you, what can you tell us about your experience of like full spectrum cannabis oil? Have you ever um, had much on the ground experience of using it, and anecdotal cases of people having improvements and recoveries with it? Yeah. So, the thing to understand with cannabis oil, or what I, the way I look at it is, okay, already using turpentine. So to heal people, I use uh, diet, cleansing, you know, pooping more often, like vitality capsule, enemas, juicing, liver flushes, uh, you know, list, list, list. So you read you can do colonics for no, like mucoid no, no. plaque? No? I'm not a fan. No, I don't know. Okay. So 
Why not? Because the, the colon has three segments, ascending, transverse, descending. And when you do a colonic, you empty all three segments. Okay. Uh, your body intended to reabsorb enzymes for digestion and various nutrients in the first ascending and in the transverse section. So when you do a colonic, it's extremely depleting. It wipes out your digestive enzymes because your body can't recycle them like it's intended to. Okay. So enemas, you're basically emptying out only the descending part of the colon and not even all of that. So it's more harmonious with your body. It lets your body reabsorb the uh, nutrients it wants to reabsorb in the ascending and transverse colon. Awesome. Awesome. I'm going back to um, the cannabis, yeah, if you could. So I've not seen any addition cannabis has to offer over the other stuff. Okay. Does that mean it doesn't work? No. That means many people may choose to do that instead of. Right. So that's pretty much where the, this niche is. I have not found it to ever cure anything. What does that mean? It means once you start using it and it helps you, you pretty much use it for life. So it doesn't solve the underlying problem. It's the medical approach in a um, dressed up in a natural arena. Right. Yeah, because um, you know, things like this, obviously in, in the in the island of Great Britain, the United Kingdom Corporation has got the uh, the show running. So things like this, you've got the Cancer Act, so you can't, you know, uh advise people to describe these kind of alternative remedies at the moment it is only kind of chemotherapy which is um supposedly localized um beneficial but as, as as an overall kind of look at chemotherapy it does seem to be that it's not the ideal kind of treatment there's so many other things you can use alternatively again i think that people need to get out of their minds that the government has any role at all in their healing. They need to understand their healing is a matter between they themselves and their body. It is not for any external uh, authority to dictate. So when you say the XYZ legal act, the government says blah, 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 it's like, wait, what? Of course, I agree with you, yeah. Yeah. So I think it's the, the, the responsibility really lies with the so-called patient or the individual with the affliction. It's their responsibility to say, that act is nice. I don't even need to read it. Yeah. I, I, that's not a consideration. They're not in charge here. Could now, agree. The doctor may want to observe that act, which is his obligation because he's licensed. Yeah. But it has nothing to do with your healing. Your doctor keeping his license has nothing to do with you getting better. In fact, probably the worse you get, the more secure his license is. Unfortunately, that does seem to be the way, and a lot of people are not you know, ready to hear this information because they just can't get to grips with the fact of the situation. But it is what it is, and I, you know, I've come to, you've come to the conclusion on the ground through your own life experience of being right in there, you know, whereas me, I've just been on the outskirts a recipient of some kind of treatment and just no, observing no, and researching. An outsider, not being a licensed physician, not seeing person after person after person, you're relying on censored information. Information that's censored by the very people who set the deadly standards that are harming you. Like your doctor's not killing you or mutilating you or assaulting you because he hates you, nothing personal. It's just his job. It's what he's told to do. And the propaganda network is telling you otherwise. And so for many people, it's a huge task to accept their personal observation above and beyond the propaganda. But that's the challenge. Yeah, that's the challenge. We're all just trying to help each other along the way, basically. Some people are more kind of um, in tuned in a way to things than others, but by all kind of getting all the information out there and coming together, we will get this kind of common understanding and we will kind of get to grips with everything that we need to, um, you know, with regards to self-health and looking after each other. And just to do something that is so effective that you've seen with your own eyes and tested and with all your patients that it costs next to nothing. It's like, well, yeah. 
know, say no more, right? Say no more, and you know, it is what it is. Dr. Daniels, can I ask you about um, your understanding of the removal of like amalgam fillings and mercury fillings and having them removed? Do you have any much from knowledge my, of my um, understanding? Again, you have your understanding and you have your observation. Hmm. Your observation fuels your understanding. So my observation is when people get their amalgams removed, half of them are better and half of them are way worse. So it's a real crapshoot. Mm -hmm. So I personally never, ever recommend removal of amalgam. Okay. I recommend not getting them in. I don't recommend removal. Well, that's it. Yeah, ideally we recommend them not going in, but if you've already got them. So you're saying then, yeah, 50-50 is not really good odds, is it, when you're messing around with stuff like that? It is. Until we find better methodologies then. The people who are devastated by it are devastated by it. Their lives are ruined. Their lives are ruined. Of course, they blame the dentist who removed it for poor removal technique. I am not so sure about that. But all I'm saying is having amalgams removed does not appear to be beneficial. Personally, I had the, the bad fortune of getting a root canal as a child when I was 16. And um, I still have that root canal today. Would I get it removed? Absolutely not. Do I recommend people get the root canals removed? No. But I do recommend they don't put them in. So um, the thing to understand is the root canal, the amalgam, is just a focus. So because you have that in place, Maybe you need to make a little extra effort to stay healthy, but that little extra effort is probably far easier than getting it removed. So my root canal, it used to bother me about four times a year. Just a little tingle that I'm aware of. Now it doesn't bother me at all, never, ever. Nice. Right. Thank you, thank you. And yeah, it's been a lovely chat. Thank you very much. I think to round off before, was there anything you wanted to circle back to before I asked you my last question? Um, I think the most important thing people need to realize about healing is the problem, the cause of the disease, and the solution is totally in their hands. And reliance on the modern day healthcare system is simply not supported by science or any objective measures. And so they should feel free to uh, cast their net a little wider. Thank you. No, I appreciate that. Yeah, I know I'm seeing it on the ground. Lots of people are coming away from, you know, mainstream and conventional and are, are looking for alternative, but there's so much, you know, there's so much out there. I think we've, I this is what I'm trying to do, you know, just trying to get, Trying to get to the to the to the crux Everything of it all, right? This is it. This is it. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And so, for people who would like to explore your work a little bit further, Dr. Daniels, where can they find your stuff? I know you do the podcast. Oh yes. Well, they can go to vitalitycapsules.com, and they can get their free report on the wonders of turpentine. Um, then, I also have a monthly uh, membership. Uh, program where I do what you're trying to do today, which is keep people up to speed on the different changes in the natural and conventional medicine arena. Help people understand what is what is, you know, GCMAF, what is stem cell, and what would how would you accomplish those results that they promise using another less expensive, more convenient, more ma more natural method. So. Then that's a monthly program. They can find out more about that at vitalitycapsules.com forward slash heal at home. And so my goal is to, is to educate people to the point they can literally handle every medical event at home without calling emergency, without seeing a doctor or going to the hospital and get excellent outcomes. Well, that's uh, admirable indeed because, you know, what a nice place for us to be able to be at. Like I say, we talk about, um, you know, the issues and the problems we've got with the system. But I always do say, if I'm ever involved in a major accident, you know, base jump in and I, my parachute doesn't open, I, I would very much like to, you know, you know, use the A&E facilities. I do respect the work the doctors do, but okay, it is a lot of stuff we need to get to, you know. Go on. That is your opinion. 
opinion, and you're entitled to it. So my opinion is, if I fall and my parachute is not open, please, with all due respect, grab in my bones or pieces, whatever, take me home, put me to bed. Maybe I'll make it. Maybe I won't. <laughs> um, okay. They did a study in Philadelphia. Philadelphia, just for your information, if you don't know, it's a very violent city in America, and there's a lot of gunshots. People get shot and killed. And so they did a study on people who were shot with guns and ones who came to the, the um, hospital via ambulance and ones who came via private car. What do you think they found? Um, a lot more dead on arrivals in the ambulances. Correct. It's be a Megatron. Yeah, there we go. Higher death. There we go. So I'm going to fall on a plane. I want an ambulance to come. No, thank you. I'm good. Oh, I just don't have anyone around me. I could trust to reset my bones, oh, but I, you make a valid point. No, you make a valid point. I know, I know. a different threshold, and you have to realize yeah. where your threshold is. So my threshold, based on my experience and my knowledge and whatever, is I'm good. So in other yeah. words, most people don't understand, when you have an accident, most accidents are so serious, you're going to die no matter what the doctor does. Or they're so trivial, you're going to live no matter what the doctor does. And that's it. That, mm -hmm. once, and, and that's additional information you didn't have. Yeah. People don't understand that. But once you know that, you're like, I'm good. Home, it's a game changer, actually. When you put it like that, yeah. When you put it like that, it has kind of, but, it does resonate, yeah. People, they don't have that information. So they're making their decision, again, with a false database. And so what really stuns me, appalls me, and shocks me, is you have these people, they're adults. They're sane. They're of average or even above average intelligence. And they're making decisions a three-year-old would make. Why? Because they have a database filled with false information. And the three-year-old, his database of false information has not been created yet. So he's working on it. Whoa, this don't look good to me. Like when I was three years old, I said, whoa, this does not look good to me. <laughs> so uh, you've got to realize you have a system that's the third leading cause of death, a system that positively increases your chances of dying, especially when you're critically ill. It makes no sense to engage that system. Because you're weak, you're, just, you're, not, you're less likely to Yeah, no, I can't argue with that, unfortunately. I'm afraid I don't have any arguments here because I know, you, I know what you're saying is... You can say, hey, noted. I still want yeah. doctors when I break a leg. No, I get what you mean, but... To that I say, I get what you mean. Okay, respect it, no problem. You don't have to agree with me. No, it's not, the, it's not the thing of agreeing. It's just I understand your perspective, you know. I'm not going to try and convince you. Yeah, you know, it is. It's one of those good... Well, bit, based on what we were just saying, I do something else has just popped into my mind. So if I can ask one more before I let you go, if you'd be so kind. This whole stuff that I'm finding recently, which is with regards to... Um, Family members being told that their um, their relative is brain dead, with regards to kind of um, you know what I'm getting at yeah where they kind of they're essentially harvesting organs right when people are not and people people are being told he's not going to wake up he's brain dead or she and then you, okay well we'll give it a little few days and then oh there's a miracle they're awake and they're fine and there's nothing wrong with them what have you seen about this and how much of it do you think is uh, you know from your perspective is there much truth to it or do you think it's kind of I kind of already know what you're going to say. You have, think, of, but... again, you have a lot of assumptions that you've made just in asking this question that are false. Okay. For example, brain dead. You are assuming that brain dead means the person is dead. It's not true. Okay. So let's back up to what's going on here. You have an industry, okay? A big industry. If I took you right now and 100% harvested you, transplanted everything that can be transplanted, your cornea, your skin, your tendons, your pancreas, your liver, blah, everything. It would generate $11.4 million of revenue in the medical industrial complex. Cool. Right here, on the hook. Yes, and you're walking outside on the street, not even under guard. I mean, you even lock your door. You probably don't even have 11.4 million bucks of stuff in your house, you know? <laughs> Just say it. <laughs> this is true. So what happens then is the industry wants to be able to get organs from people who are not dead. How do you do that? <clears throat> you redefine death. Okay, 
let's have this definition called brain dead. The person's still alive. Okay, so you can harvest organs from living people who fall into these, this definition. And now they're agitating to harvest organs from people where death is, listen to this, not inevitable, but imminent. You get that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's put, put it real, real precisely for you. They are now passing legislation to authorize the harvesting of organs from people who are very sick, but who would otherwise live had the organs not been harvested. Cool. So what you don't understand is they already got through the brain dead designation, which authorizes them to harvest organs from certain living people. And now what they're doing is they're extending that definition, extending it, extending it to the point where they can even just grab you off the street. That's what's going on. So were you lied to? No, you were not. Did the doctor do the right thing, the wrong thing? No, he did not. You or your family or whoever did not understand the situation they were in. They did not understand that when you show up to the emergency room, you're saying, hey, take my organs. You want them? What you think? That's really what you're doing, a little audition there. Some people, they go for it. But me? I said, you know what? I don't, need, I don't need an emergency room. I'm good. No hospital. I'm good. In fact, I live in a jungle on the side of a mountain with the road so bad, the ambulance couldn't reach me. I'm good. I'm okay. But most people are not in touch with the reality of what's going on to have the confidence to make that kind of uh, commit firm decision. And I, I wish I could sit here and tell you, oh, you know, why well, I'm more intelligent than you are. No, it's not true. What is true is I've seen it from a different angle. I'm like, holy cow. I mean, even telling you my story, you'd almost say, well, geez, were you retarded? Why didn't you figure it out earlier? <laughs> so how can I sit here and say that someone else is not intelligent? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, of course. But what I can do is try to share my insights so people can benefit from my experience and my perspective. And then they can go check it out. Check it out. Check it out. And I have a little series of replays on my site at vitalitycapsules.com. Can you go there, click replays, where I go over these types of examples. I even go over the video of the show is if you knew what you were worth. I mean, you're going to feel a little different walking down the street now knowing you're worth $11.4 million, right? Oh, yeah. Older. I wonder if I've got anything that's spare, anything they can take that I don't really need, you know? I'm joking. But yeah. No, they'll take it, they'll take it. They'll take it a lot, I know. They'll leave nothing behind. Well, Dr. Daniels, it's been lovely getting this narrative started, and um, hopefully we'll be able to um, catch up again real soon and kind of keep up to date with the latest findings because every day is a school day, right? We're finding out new Absolutely. stuff all the time. Awesome, awesome. Well, I'll put all the links to your um, website and the uh, podcast and stuff in the description box. And, uh, yes, thank you again, as I say, for taking the time and coming and sharing your uh, life experience with us. Okay, you're welcome. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Awesome. Well, you take care of yourself. We'll speak with you soon. All the best.